In Psalm 19.9, we read that the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. This is something that may be easy to admit that we believe when everything is going well, we're going the way that we expect. But other than that, we need to take it as a word of comfort when things are not going well. And that is visibly, they're not going well. We walk by faith and not by sight. Please remember that. Uh, but I, what I'd like to talk to you about today is believing God, loving him for who he is. Only too many times I fear that the church today is focused on the good times. They're thinking they're going to have family. They're going to have friends. They're going to have work. They're going to be uh, liked. They're going to have good health. Everything is going to pretty much go the way they want it to. And this is a part of this prosperity gospel that we're facing so much here in these last days. But uh, my wife belongs to a group on Facebook that they are focused around the end times. They have commentary that focuses a lot around end times. And a few days ago, she read a quote from uh, something shared from a man who is, a, is 70 years old. And he said, wow, I've always believed in the pre-tribulation rapture, but I've been studying scripture, looking in scripture, and, and that doesn't seem to be true. It looks like it's post-tribulation rapture. To this, my wife and I said, yay! <laughs> and we don't say that just because people want to be will believe the same way we do. It is a danger if you don't, because if you think the Lord is coming first and he doesn't, you are set up for the imitation of the Antichrist. You will think the Antichrist is Christ. And that can be a real problem because, uh, well, the enemy is very deceitful. We will, have, we will have links in the description to rapture correction warning. And I believe there's another video also about the Antichrist. And so you can look at those at your leisure. But in response, I mean, this person, you know, shared this and it was very, very good. And my wife put like an amen or something uh, approving. Wouldn't you know, I mean, you just, she, he just got a flood of comments after that because nobody wants to think anything except the Lord is going to come first and whoosh, he's just going to grab us and take us away from all the really bad stuff, you know. Uh, it's not enough that, you know, Jesus died on the cross for our sins or he's going to give us an eternity and glory with him with perfect health and everything's good. Uh, we have to have it right now, you see. But anyway, there was one there was one person, I believe it was a woman, one person in particular that said, wow, I, I wouldn't want to serve a God like that. If my God was going to make me go through the tribulation, I don't think I could love him. I don't think I could serve him. And while that might sound really terrible, that is pretty much where most people are at. If they're if they are under the impression that God is going to be uh, chastening them or allow them to be refined or tested in these ways, they really don't want anything to do with him. That's not what's being promoted in churches. You don't hear it from the pulpit, but the Bible is filled with it. And yet that's the Bible that, that every church says that they follow. And so I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about this. Uh, as I quoted from Psalm 19, we must believe in faith that the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And he just doesn't take away everything from us. And again, unfortunately, one of the one of the most prevalent things I can compare this to is these is this last days prophecy, because it is a tribulation period that Christians have to go through. And many will fall away during that time. There are going to be many dead. This is what the word tells us. I mean, where where is our heart? Where are our affections? But I want to kind of, I want to be there an example, but kind of back away a little bit too. One of the great examples I want to use here is from, is found in Jeremiah 45. Now, if you're comparing the end times to anything, you should look at the book of Jeremiah. Because, of course, in Revelation, we have Mystery Babylon, the judgment of Mystery Babylon in Revelations chapter eight, 17 and 18. Uh, but there is also the initial judgment of Babylon that's being covered in Jeremiah. 
And this is very, very, very similar. It's a very good template, a good way to look at and anticipate, you know, what God is planning to do. Now, at this time, of course, uh, Jerusalem had fallen, Israel had fallen, everything had fallen in this area to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, Baruch of Neriah was the scribe to Jeremiah. And this chapter in, uh, in Jeremiah 45 was dedicated entirely to him. It's only five verses long. But I want you to hear what the Lord says to Baruch. This was given to Jeremiah, and Jeremiah was kind of Baruch's scribe at this time. Starting with verse 2, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, unto thee, O Baruch, thou didst say, Woe is me now, for the Lord has added grief to my sorrow. I fainted in my sighing, and I find no rest. Thus shalt thou say unto him, The Lord saith thus, Behold, that which I have built will I break down, and that which I have planted I will pluck up, even this whole land. And seekest thou great things for thyself? Seek them not, for behold, I will bring evil upon all flesh, saith the Lord. But thy life will I give unto thee for a prey in all places whither thou goest. So all God is promising to Baruch here is to watch out for him in his life. He's going to supply his need. He's going to keep him alive. But he's not going to cause him to prosper. Of course, Baruch was faithful in being the scribe to Jeremiah for 40 years. During all this time, Jeremiah was prophesying and enduring grief and whatnot. So, you know, you might expect a little bit of reward from the Almighty, but he wasn't going to get it. And he was facing the kind of grief that everyone was facing. This is the time of God's judgment. And when we come to the time of the end, this, these last days, this is also a time of God's judgment. He refers to it as vengeance over and over and over again, both in Revelation and elsewhere. If we look in the book of Luke, uh, the shortest verse to, to quote is Luke 21, 22. Jesus said, these are the days of vengeance, when all the things that are written by the prophets will be fulfilled. All things. So he said, these are the days of vengeance. We see this also in Luke 18. Jesus is talking about vengeance. If you would look at Luke at the end of chapter 17 and then beginning of 18, that's where the vengeance comes in. Now, they separated it by chapter, but I say that this is likely the same reference because it's talking about these last days, and we already know uh, that these are days of vengeance, that God will be avenging, really, he will be avenging himself. He will be, he will be avenging his servants that have suffered for him. And this is entirely appropriate. We see this in Jeremiah 51.6 and Revelation 18.6. You're talking about vengeance, one upon Babylon and then upon mystery Babylon. These are the days of vengeance. In Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 to 11, uh, there are souls under the altar crying out. I'm trying to think of this. Is this a uh, seal? I believe this is one of the seals under the altar. It's, and these were, there were souls crying out saying, Lord, how long will it be until you avenge us of our blood? They have shed his innocent blood. Are you going to take revenge? And he says a little while longer until the rest of uh, the rest of your fellow servants should be killed the way you were. Wow, that's really incredible. And then we see it again in Revelation 14. There is an angel flying in the heaven. And he's talking about, what's he talking about? He's talking about vengeance coming upon those that have been putting to death, putting to death the saints. We are talking about vengeance. And this is not such a pleasant topic, I know. But what we have to understand is that the world has had 2,000 years to do something with the message of Jesus Christ. God has concluded that all men are under sin and we are separated from him. But because he does love us, he sent his son to bear the wrath, to bear his own wrath for us in our place so that we might be saved. Now, this is an incredible example of exactly what we're talking about here. We're really talking about accepting God's character. 
But you see, his ways are so high, so far above us, that we really don't know what to, what, what he's up to. We see things and we say, oh, wow, well, God is doing this, and then he doesn't do it. Or no, he, God means for this to take place, and then it doesn't seem to be taking place. Oh, boy, we face these kinds of things all the time. George Mueller faced it one time when he was purchasing land for the purchase, I believe, of his final two orphan houses, four, four and five. It was God's time. He had the money years before to buy, to buy the land, but it was God's time then. And when he did, when he went to buy it, there were three obstacles that stood in his way. And one obstacle was there was someone living on the land, a part of the land. Another obstacle was that the owner was asking for considerably more than the land was worth. And uh, the third thing was he had heard that the waterworks of the town were considering, you know, taking part of the land uh, for their own use. But one by one, the Lord removed those obstacles. So you can see our faith is going to be tried. But Jesus' sacrifice on the cross really shows us that combination, that combination of God's love, judgment, justice, mercy, wrath. Because what happens is, because we are separated from God by our sins, and it's very serious to the Lord, we are deserving of his wrath. His justice must be satisfied. But we could not do that. We cannot bear that. We would just be utterly destroyed. And so God sent his son who lived a perfect life to take our place, to bear the, the wrath and satisfy God's justice so that we could lay hold of that and have eternal life. He did this out of love. He did this out of mercy, but we're also seeing wrath. And so I hope you can understand what I'm trying to say. As this woman, of course, shared her consternation that God uh, may require them to go through the tribulation. She said, I don't want to serve a God like that. That's a real shame because he will be ever faithful. He will be with her the whole way through. So I just like you to think about this. I like you to consider for yourself, where are you at with this? Do you accept God's judgments? Can you praise him? Could your words be like that of Job who said, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him? I see some of these things here, uh, just for a quick comparison. Number one, we might face a world judgment. How would we feel about the world being judged? Well, in the days of Noah, we're probably all for it because it didn't affect us. It was then we read about it in scripture. We say, okay. But when, we, when it comes to mystery Babylon and the judgments of, during the days of Revelation, we might have to go through that. And so this is where we really need to pull in close to the Lord and walk by faith, trusting in him. If we think about criminal judgment, this is where God really shines. For the people who keep wanting to say that God is love and only love, well, that wouldn't really do it because we need a God who's going to punish evildoers. We wouldn't want him to, to let them get away with things. He has to require it of them. And the phrase God is love, is only used twice in the Bible, in the same chapter, in 1 John chapter 4, verses 8 and 16, and it's not found, that phrase is not found anywhere else in Scripture, including the phrase that God's love endures forever is never found in the King James Bible. It's only His mercy endures forever, and there is a difference. If we start to think about loved ones being judged, well, we don't, love that, we don't like that. Because that is usually hitting close to home, things that we really feel inside. And for this, so many times it comes down to whatever, whoever passed away, well, they're in heaven, God loves them, it's okay. But we're really not thinking about where they were in relation to God's Son, Jesus Christ. And of course, finally, it would be about our own judgment. And the scripture says plainly in 1 Corinthians eleven thirty one and 32, if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are, we are uh, chastened of the Lord so that we won't be condemned with the world. So in other words, God is bringing us a little correction here, and then we won't have to answer for it for eternity. That's a very kind and loving God, even though when we're going through the chasing, it will seem grievous at the time. So I'd just like to encourage you to dig deep in your faith, 
because this is the time when we really have to. And whether you think the, tribu the, uh, the rapture is coming quickly or not, as a Christian, you will be growing and everything is preparation for the next step. God has promised us that we have to go through tribulation on our way to eternal life. But he is faithful and he will not let you down. Please give this good prayer in consideration. I pray that God would bless it uh, to your well-being. Thank you.